good evening and welcome to the 25th year anniversary celebration for the writer's journey. Um, the key word for tonight is celebration. This evening is a very special celebration of a book, a movement, and a man. We want this to be a special, entertaining, enlivening, and engaging evening. Let's start with the book. The book has sold over 400,000 copies and has been translated into multiple languages and has had far reaching impact into the entertainment industry. But this is more than a book, this is really a movement. This book has impacted songwriters, game designers, scientists, social workers, politicians, businesses. It has had far reaching and profound impact. And last but not least, let's celebrate the man tonight, Chris Vogler. He's the brilliant mind behind this book, but I don't wanna leave out that Chris is a great man, a beautiful man. He's humble, gracious, generous, brilliant, insightful. And it's important to me and I think to everyone to also celebrate Chris as well as his great work. So anyways, to get this party and celebration started, I am going to introduce my co-host for the evening, Dr. Will Lynn. And he will walk you through our further presenters and um, give a little bit of a sketch of the evening. So uh, Will Lynn is a rising young academic superstar in this whole area of myth and storytelling and personal transformative narrative. We don't have many in this area, but if we have Will, we're in good shape. Will has a PhD in mythology from Pacifica. He has also founded a department at Hussein College where he teaches storytelling and myth. He is currently writing The Skeleton Key to a Hero's with a thousand faces. And he is frequently, frequently featured on panels and documentaries and as an expert in this uh, new rising field of personal narrative. So without any further ado, I, kick, I hand you over to my colleague, Will Lynn. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, oh my gosh, what an introduction. It's my privilege to welcome one of the coolest audiences of all time. Screenwriters and filmmakers, psychologists and physical therapists, mythologists, religious scholars, travel leaders, entrepreneurs, novelists, poets, musicians, dancers, politicians, and journalists. You're all here. And you're all here because we share something in common. We've all been moved by this book. And that presents one of the framing questions for our evening. What is it in this book that's bringing us all together? What does a filmmaker have in common with a mythologist? What does a psychologist have in common with a travel guide? All of us study transformational narratives. And the reason we're with Darren and Jeff tonight, and the reason this is a Mythos Sophia event, is because we want the true scope of this book to be on full display. And to do that, we have to step back from the elephant. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with that story of one person describing the elephant while touching the tail, and another one describing it while touching the ears. Well, this is the state of the hero's journey. Psychologists might see it as a tool for healing, while a mythologist might see it as a hermeneutic approach to their scholarship, and a filmmaker might, filmmaker might use it as a model for their movies. One of the main goals tonight is to step back, to see that we share something in common, and it's bringing us together through this book. Psychologists, mythologists, filmmakers, we're all interested in, in the study and mastery of transformational narrative. And no book since the writer's journey has had more of an impact on those of us who are pursuing transformational narrative from whatever world we come from. And the reason for this is one of the things we want to champion all night. There is a lineage of great works and teachers on transformational narratives, from Jungian individuation and Campbell on the hero's journey to Jeff Kripal's work on authorship, or even Snyder's Save the Cat. And Michael Wiese, by the way, has published a few of these. Whether you're a screenwriter or you're a ritual study scholar, we share a canon of texts on transformational narrative. And in that canon, Vogler did something very special. He fused two lines, at least. On one hand, he furthered the conversations with Jung and Campbell at Aranos and Esalen, and not to mention the fact that he brings in Vladimir Prof and the traditional folklore. And this introduces to a very psychological, mythological, folkloric, and personal approach to the hero's journey. And on the other hand, he furthered a Hollywood conversation on screenwriting that focuses on movie examples. This is the conversation we associate with Sid Field and Robert McKee later on, but with the writer's, uh, with the writer's journey, Chris Vogler, once and for all, fused these lineages, and he brought these conversations together, like I hope we're doing tonight. We saw this coming with Lucas Love of Joseph Campbell, and we've seen it continue with Dara Marks and Blake Snyder. But this is the book. This is that magic book. 
that did the deed. The writer's journey brought myth to a book for filmmakers and storytellers. And tonight, 25 years later, we couldn't be more pleased that this book has brought all of us together, that we're all here, filmmakers, mythologists, psychologists, therapists, healers, travelers, travel guides, all of us who want to experience narrative transformation. So thank you all for joining us. I hope you'll all keep up with Mythosophia's mission to bring everyone together from whatever world you're coming from to engage transformational narrative. It's going to be an incredible evening with Chris, Darren, and Jeff, the former of which I'd like to now welcome and introduce. So uh, Chris and Darren, if you'd like to join us on screen. Darren Aronowski is the director of Pi, Requiem for a Dream, The Fountain, The Wrestler, Noah, Mother, and Black Swan, for which he uh, was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Director. And this brings us to the man of the hour, Christopher Vogler. Christopher Vogler is author of The Writer's Journey, a former studio executive, story analyst, uh, teacher of writing workshops around the world. And of course, we'll continue to hear more tributes and introductions uh, to Chris throughout the evening. So thank you both. Uh, and I'm looking forward to talking about myth and film with the two of you. Chris, I wanted to ask you about that, actually, because because somebody's picked up on you making a line, saying this exact line, the, 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 uh, the monster's journey, the antagonist's journey. Can you speak to that and the significance of that in your work? Yeah, absolutely. It was clear to me right away that um, uh, this was a mirror situation and that uh, especially by looking at the darker films, film noir, uh, I found that uh, although the heroes of those sometimes were what we call anti-heroes mm -hmm. and um, maybe were punished by society and they ended up tragically, they thought they were uh, the hero of their own story. Mm. And so uh, I, I saw that, that maybe there's two graphs in, in a story which has a strong villain and a strong hero. Uh, and and they, they go... Uh, in opposite directions. When the hero's up, the villain's down, and vice versa. And this is one of the things I admire about uh, Darren. And as soon as we connected, I knew that he was going to be one who would run with the ball mm -hmm. and would not take it on face value, uh, would uh, take it as, oh, here's a wonderful toy. And we can do all these things with it, and we don't have to feel uh, chained by it. Uh, and, and this is in contrast to some students who uh, took the idea on and they were sort of in manacles uh, about it. And, and they would actually put into their screenplay, uh, step one, the ordinary world, step two, the call to adventure, thinking that would guarantee they'd, they'd have success. This is one of the big things that I, we've been getting questions to me because I've never really checked this out with you. And um, I, I'm amazed because this is exactly the way I do it. Um, and it reminds me of something that happened uh, when I was working with Disney and um, they had gained some awareness of what I was doing. Uh, this is even before the book came out. Um, and I had distributed a, a memo throughout the studio system, which had this system in it. And I thought when I went to animation, I would have to sell them on the idea. But when I walked in the first day, the Lion King was outlined on a cork board in the lobby already with the all those things you're talking about, OW and CA and all those other uh, shorthand ways of, of referring to the journey. So they uh, gobbled it up and I didn't have to do that job of sales. You know, as you were speaking about the early days of this for you, I uh, was hit by something you said about a professor who steered you in that direction. Mm -hmm. And that's important to me because I wouldn't be here if not for a professor. Uh, there was a, a professor of uh, film studies and uh, uh, he was an expert in film noir uh, and uh, Professor Joseph Andrew Casper at USC. And... I just said something out loud in class, like, um, I think I see a mythic icon in a movie we had just viewed. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I don't know. It just sounded good. And he said, uh, well, if you're interested in these mythic things, there's a book. Uh, go to the library, get The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Camel. Mm -hmm. So I uh, went and checked it out. I flipped through it on the bus on the way home. 
And by the time I got off the bus, my life was completely changed. And I, I knew, well, this is what I was looking for. This is the uh, secret code. Uh, because I knew there had to be one. And I, as a kid, even, was on a quest trying to find uh, th that algorithm, we would call it now, uh, 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 that helps to organize stories so you know you've checked the boxes and that you've got all that essential stuff. But there were um, ordeals along the way and certainly a lot of self-questioning. And um, it was uh, a great laboratory for me to go into the studio system because it's just mm. absolutely cutthroat and there's no mercy and um, you're just thrown sink or swim into the middle of it uh, and you have to defend your ideas. And um, this was, uh, I thought, a useful thing to, to kind of keep secret to myself. And little by little, I fed it out there and I actually made a tour when I worked at Fox. I went around to all the executive offices and peeked in and looked on their bookshelves. They had bookshelves in those days. And um, I looked around to see, was there any hint of Campbell? And I saw the hero with a thousand faces on the shelves of several executives. So I started a conversation with those people. And I think it was uh, an ordeal for me uh, when I worked at Disney, that somebody plagiarized the little memo that I'd written, the seven-page memo, and I thought, well, that's the end of things. Somebody stripped me off, and you know, somebody else is going to get the credit. But it ended up being, as the supreme ordeal often is, the key to everything else, because uh, it landed on the desk of Jeffrey Katzenberg, and I uh, got my nerve together and approached him and said, hey, somebody else uh, has ripped me off on this. I'm the author and I want some more involvement in the company. And uh, he called me immediately and said, go work with animation. They've got this new thing, The Lion King. <laughs> this uh, little thing. So, uh, so uh, that's where they need you right now. So it was really the, uh, uh, the instrument for me of uh, getting much deeper in and uh, uh, testing my ideas uh, the way a, a Supreme ordeal will do. You know, so first of all, thank you for that. A really meaningful movie for people that I care very much about. Uh, but while we're on Black Swan, I wanted to ask, you know, uh, you've worked extensively with feminine characters and concepts. And I'm thinking especially of Black Swan, but also Mother. Uh, meanwhile, one of the standard questions of the hero's journey is whether or not it's too masculine. So I'm wondering if you would both be willing to open up a little bit about the feminine in your work. Yeah, I, I'm... Uh... Uh, fascinated by this because, uh, you know, I'm a man and uh, I, I can't really ever cross the gulf to understand what it sounds like or looks like to women. Uh, but I have some suspicions and guesses that uh, it has something to do with um, the, the geometry of how you create a graph uh, how you uh, create some kind of representation of the story. Uh, we've already talked about how you do a, a list this way. Uh, I draw it as a circle. Uh, Sid Field draws structure as a, uh, like a railroad track. Mm -hmm. It's a linear uh, way of looking at things. And uh, I actually went more for the circle because I feel it's a little more feminine uh, as, as a shape, as a concept. Um, and, uh, you know, it takes into account the idea of cycles, which the straight line doesn't really consider. So um, I, I'm also thinking about uh, other geometries along the lines of concentric circles mm. that uh, the woman's journey, as I see it, uh, as it's told to me by women, uh, is something about going deeper and deeper inward. And uh, along the way, addressing um, the social aspects. The, how does the rest of society feel about this? How do I feel as I go in with all of my internal um, parts that, from my mother and my sisters? And, uh, you know, how do I deal with other women? Uh, and ultimately going to some feminine source, which I will never know anything about. Uh, and, and so then maybe going back out concentrically to take those learnings and uh, apply them elsewhere. Just a, a, a simple thing that educated me a little bit 
about the differences in male and female ways of, of playing and of uh, playing games and competing and so forth. Is well, you know, that's actually a really great point because one of the things we're trying to do tonight is, is go beyond just celebrating Chris's book and celebrate its place in history, its place in a larger conversation. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a very special place. And I think that one of the things that in moving this direction, one of the things it suggests is that this is an ongoing conversation. And the question of how women and femininity plays into narratives of transformation, hero's journey, heroine's journey, uh, you know, it's something that, that uh, needs to be continuously engaged and discussed. And as you said, um, you know, especially right now where things are kind of changing uh, in a certain way and, um, and we're kind of noticing, recognizing some transformations. And a little bit later on, we're going to be talking to uh, Jeffrey Kripal, uh, who's the uh, chair of the uh, board at Esalen. And this book was also written at Esalen by a guy named Richard Tarnas. And this book's called Passion in the Western Mind. And what it's about is a kind of coming to a finale, potentially even a, very much a Darren Aronofsky story, because the end of the story is the death of the Western male psyche uh, and a kind of movement beyond uh, its limited frame. And I actually, in, in a longer conversation, would make my argument that I don't actually think the writer's journey is fundamentally limited to a masculine frame. If we look at this uh, you know, little loop that we always look at, <laughs> then uh, the reality is that that loop is, you know, when we go into the underworld and we come out, simplest, simplest version of it there is. And the oldest heroine's journey, the oldest hero's journey, the oldest great mythic uh, story we have is of Inanna and a very, very old one of Persephone. And Inanna and Persephone go into the underworld and come out. They fulfill the structure beautifully. And these are stories that probably predate in their earliest echoes uh, any kind of, you know, overly masculine overlays. So hopefully, you know, we're going to continue to expand this conversation for forever and ever, you know, um, you know, and so, yeah. I've got one uh, for you, uh, Darren, which is, uh, I use the wrestler a lot in my classes. Mm. And um, I am particularly interested from the hero's journey point of view in the, the this very full expression of the idea of mentors and gifts. That movie really opened my eyes about the power of gifts. And, uh, you know, you have made a wonderful uh, mentor out of the Marisa Tomei character. She's a stripper, but she operates as a classic mentor, uh, guiding the wrestler to give a gift and helping him pick out the right gift. And he gives her a gift for her son and so forth. And I just thought that it was a wonderful elaboration of that uh, of that theme. So before we jump over, <laughs> speaking of being taught, it's so amazing to have so many teachers in the audience tonight. But before we jump over and we're going we're gonna to open up to the next segment, I just want to ask before we do, if either of you would be interested in speaking to the shadow in your work. I see it. I, I believe I'm seeing it in your work. Darren, you speak about it in, in the archetypal frame. And we haven't talked about archetypes as much. And, and I thought maybe uh, that would be a good archetype for us to touch on. Yeah, I'll just kick that off. Uh, mm -hmm. The shadow is something that I didn't really understand very well at first. I thought when I was looking at Jung's archetypes, I needed something to cover the bad guys, uh, the villains. And the shadow sounded like a match for it. And it does cover that uh, because the shadows are like the negative projections of the possibilities of the hero. But also, I learned... Uh, that the shadow represents all sorts of things in yourself that you don't like or you can't accept or you have uh, uh, pushed them down somehow. And there's a mechanism there that the more you push those things down and repress them, the stronger they are. And they come out in Freudian slips or in weird behavior uh, that uh, it tends to turn, it can turn a hero into a villain uh, from the point of view of those around him. So that's kind of my uh, quickie on uh, on the shadow. Thank you. And I know our friend Connie Zweig is very excited to hear you talk about that. And you've actually really segued perfectly into our uh, next segment. Uh, we're now, you know, you started talking about how shadow related to your own life. And that's what we'd like to talk about while we have a little bit of time with you left. Uh, Darren is a uh, myth and, and life and the hero's journey in our own lives. And to do that, I want to bring in uh, a couple more of our uh, friends here, Corinne Bordeaux and also Dana White. Um, allow me to introduce Corinne. Uh, Corinne is the founder and president of 360 Degree Communications, which is a, a leading marketing firm that specializes in independent films, especially uh, independent films that are on the wavelength of, of mythology and transformation. 
Under her leadership, the company has designed campaigns for movies like uh, Free Solo, The Cove, Boyhood, Fantastic Fungi, Biggest Little Farm, and Cartel. Uh, she's the um, founder and director of the Esalen Film Festival, and she has a master's degree in myth from Pacifica Graduate Institute, where she studied uh, or gave focus on myth and cinema. So thanks for joining us, Corinne, uh, and I hope you'll introduce Jeff to welcome him in as well, and, and also Dana. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm going to, yeah, we're just all passing the baton here. I am going to introduce Jeff Kripal, who is, I've known Jeff for many, many years. He's a treasured colleague and a friend and another academic superstar. Um, his area of specialty is myth, mysticism, paranormal, and the super story, which we're about ready to take a deeper dive into. Jeff is also uh, the Associate Dean of Humanities at Rice University. He has written many acclaimed books and incredible papers. Um, for tonight's purposes, I'm gonna point out two that I think will be of great interest to the community here. One is um, Jeff has written the definitive book on Esalen and it is nothing short of extraordinary. It is called Esalen, America and the Religion of No Religion. Anyone knows Esalen, that's a perfect title. He has also written, I hope everyone can see here, a, another should be Bible, Mutants and Mystics, Science Fiction, Superhero Comics, and the Paranormal. Just what it says in the title, and it's a brilliant book. Uh, Jeff is also the chairman of the board of the Esalen Institute, and he is the co-director with Michael Murphy, Murphy of the Center of Theory and Research, where much of his great work has been incubated. So with um, great relish, I introduce you to Jeff Kripal. And then let's also bring Dana in to join us and he'll kick us off with the first question for this segment. Uh, Dana's a good friend. Dana's a, a partner on the Myth Salon uh, and has helped us put this event together. Hi, Dana. Thank you, Will. Um, I hear you talking about archetypes and myths and, and the hero's journey. And, what does all that have to do with our world today? I mean, how can we learn something from the things that you're using to make into the movies that all guide us? What can we learn about today's conditions? Because we need something to be heroic to pull us out of this pandemic. Well, I'll, I'll take that, Paul, uh, just uh, to say that um, you know, I have been playing with this toy for 25 years and it has evolved and uh, it's continuing to evolve. And that's very reassuring to me that it's not uh, over and that it keeps uh, finding its value uh, as uh, events unfold. And uh, one thing I did as soon as the uh, current COVID situation arose is I began wondering, how does it work? Uh, What's the hero's journey of this? And I found very good uh, correspondence there and some projection about where the thing might be going. The hero's journey has sort of uh, graphed one way. It has uh, peaks and valleys in it, just like we see in the uh, uh, raging in infections and problems people are having. And uh, it sort of predicts that it will rise and it will fall and then it'll rise again. And uh, it, it will be quite drastic and dramatic when it does so, but eventually we're going to find the elixir, which is, uh, you know, the, uh, the medicines we're looking for, and, and then it all will be well. So it's still living, and um, I'm delighted to find that uh, it's, it's practical and helpful, I think, to people uh, to interpret their lives and give some meaning to the current events, which are so chaotic. You know, uh, one uh, adjustment I had to make as I looked at the, the comparison between our current drastic situation and the hero's journey is that uh, when we draw graphs for movie purposes, we want the thing to be as dramatic as it possibly can be with very high peaks and very deep crashes. Uh, and we don't want that in this situation. We want things to be more or less, uh, you know, as close to flat line as we can get, which is kind of... Uh, counter uh, to the, the, uh, the programming that we have as storytellers to make everything big and dramatic. Uh, the other thing I'm looking at is that one of the basic TikToks of this system is uh, polarity, polarization. 
Uh, I noticed in the first week I started reading scripts through the studios that almost every script was highly polarized between two worlds or two ways of looking at uh, life. And um, that's, again, a good thing in a drama and maybe not so good uh, as a, a technique to run the world, you know. So uh, I think we have to uh, be a little cautious about applying the hero's journey or any of these narrative uh, comparisons uh, to our uh, the story that we're all living through together because, uh, you know, sometimes the, the dramatic imperatives are, are not healthy for us. Jeff, welcome to the conversation. I was wondering if you uh, have anything to add to what these two have just uh, contributed. Yeah, you know, thanks, Bill. I, I got asked that very question in May by a philosopher named Shahida Bari on, on the BBC, and it caught me off guard. And the basic question was, what does your thought or work have to do with the pandemic? And, you know, what I said, I'll say here again, because I think it's relevant. What I really suspect is that a lot of these people who are being put on ventilators and who are almost dying are having near-death experiences. They're essentially going on a hero's journey and they're having this classic you know, journey to the other world. And yeah. those that manage to come back and don't die, you know, we're not going to hear their stories because of our culture. You know, we're gonna, you're going to hear them described as being manic or hysterical or you know, out of their minds or something. But actually, I think for a lot of these people, they've, they've literally had a near-death experience and they've been completely changed by it. Um, so I think that's actually happening, you know, hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of times all over the planet. And the other thing I would say about the pandemic that I think is relevant here is, I think at the back of all of our minds is the fear that we're going to die, you know? And if you really believe that, and I think you should actually, um, it will push you to think about life in different ways. It'll knock you right out of your, you know, your banality as it were. So I, I think the pandemic is actually a really powerful kind of philosophical catalyst, which isn't to take away from its tragedy and, and, and horror. I don't want to romanticize it, but I do think it's having these effects on lots of people. Yes, I, I'd say too, that it's uh, an opportunity. Uh, that uh, having something drastic like, like this land in our laps has been recognized by many people as uh, an opportunity to do a cultural reset and question all sorts of assumptions that we've made. Uh, you know, we are in hero's journey terms um, uh, in early stages still where we are living in the shadow of a long period of time of doing things a certain way and making a lot of assumptions. And now a lot of that has been challenged. And so uh, it's uh, upsetting to us, but uh, it's an opportunity for us to, uh, going forward after the dust settles a little bit, maybe uh, build a world along some different principles. One of the big motifs, of course, uh, in the hero's journey is death and resurrection, uh, kind of one of the superstructures beneath all of it. And I think that that's what we're all hoping for is that this, uh, this deconstructive period will be followed by some type of reconstructive rebirth and a new day, fingers crossed. Uh, you know, we've only got a few minutes uh, for, this, for this segment, just talking about myth and, and life and how they relate to one another. And, uh, you know, really, I just want to open it up. If anybody has anything burning or of interest that they'd like to say, you know, we've only got, got um, a few more minutes with Darren. So I thought I might ask you uh, if there are any, um, any of your own personal experiences you've related to myth or related to the hero's journey. Does your relationship with myth enrich your life? And uh, is there some elixir that you uh, take away from all of this, uh, you know, something in, in, in your, your life as it was for me? Uh, a, a thing of uh, giving me some guidance and uh, a, a sense of uh, being on a path and uh, uh, right. having uh, stages of life that I that I have gone through, and uh, you know, it, as you say, hopefully carrying on uh, and uh, uh, finding some meaning in it. Yeah, that one really resonates with me. Uh, this is uh, just where I find myself now, looking uh, through these eyes 
at the world I'm in and realizing I'm part of it mm. and uh, that I am uh, just taking step after step on some path. And I actually have evolved one thing on this, which is that I am seeing myself as not separate from the path. I am mm. the path. Mm. And uh, that uh, is a little bit of an adjustment. I always thought of it as this separate thing that I would find or that I could uh, guide other people on, but uh, really, I, I think that's the way to look at it, is that uh, you create your own, and uh, through your art, through your creativity, uh, you maybe make a path for other people, but uh, uh, you you are as much uh, a factor in this as, as any, uh, any uh, path you travel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darren, for joining us as a neurologist. Thank you for your films. Uh, and as a, a fellow supporter of Chris's work, thank you for joining us tonight. And feel, do please feel free to join us uh, anytime as we continue through the evening. So, Chris, you and I are going to Esalen, and we're going to go lead a workshop at Esalen. And this is one of the things that I want to make sure we invite everybody to keep their eyes out for. Uh, this will be a time where we're still holding out hope that this will be one of the first events uh, that is actually live in the return to Esalen uh, in person. Uh, so, you know, I thought that since we had a moment, we'd extend the invitation. Yes, good. Let's take that opportunity. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about that because uh, apart from driving by, I, I don't have much uh, uh, personal contact there. Uh, always thought it was an interesting place. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I know that uh, Joseph Campbell's spirit lives there, mm -hmm. and I'm really interested in uh, getting a taste of that. So I, I look forward to our, our experience there. And I, I want to make the most of it by using the grounds and, mm -hmm. and, and getting something, uh, a, a physicalization of the hero's journey mm -hmm. by walking around and, and enjoying the uh, atmosphere there, because I think it's something that lives in us much uh, more uh, realistically and strongly when we physicalize it by moving around and, and uh, taking into account the environment. You know, I was lucky uh, to get to go to uh, Esalen for the first time at the invitation of the Joseph Campbell Foundation. And ever since then, um, I see every path at Esalen as a hero's journey. They all are. And I don't just mean the physical paths. I mean the paths that we go yeah. uh, to Esalen for. Uh, you know, Chris, um, here's, a, here's a great question. Uh, and this has been coming in uh, from all over the place. Um, what do you feel, how do you feel about, and we're going to ask uh, uh, Jeff again when he joins us, but how do you feel about this notion that the hero may be an individual, or is the hero an individual? Does the hero's journey apply to individuals, collectives, whole societies? How do you see that extending? Well, apart from uh, some collective heroes that I knew about as a kid, like the Three Musketeers, for example, mm -hmm. um, I always thought of it as an individual experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I uh, sort of formulated the ideas with that in mind. But uh, as soon as I started traveling I and teaching uh, in other countries, I began to be bombarded with other possibilities. And uh, that one in particular was uh, something that, that people brought forward was uh, we have lots of stories in our culture, they would say, uh, and we do have individual heroes. But uh, just as often, there is a, a family, a group, a tribe, the whole village, mm. uh, a, a band of brothers, as you find in Indian uh, mythology. Often, mm. they're, they're more interested in the collective. And in some cultures I, I taught in, uh, they, would, they would have fairy tales, but without the kind of distinctions we have about character. It would just be about a pig mm. and a rabbit. And they wouldn't say a funny pig or a fat pig or a silly pig. Uh, they were kind of more archetypal. Mm. And uh, the emphasis was more on the group they were in, the, the, the family, the tribe that they belonged to, than their own individual journey. Fascinating. So, so it, I've, I've learned. Since we just had uh, Darren on, who made Noah, uh, one of the particular motifs when it comes to these animal archetypes, I'm super fascinated by is what if you, we're thinking about these different animals, you know, fox, we've seen Zootopia, whatever, we, we've, we've read our Aesop's fairy tales, uh, fables. What does it mean, you know, when you take all these animal archetypes and when we think of them as archetypal characters and we put them all on one boat? I like to see it as a single psyche that's brought itself into a kind of balance and harmony. And we see it from Noah to uh, Untapishtim, uh, all the way to 
uh, the figure in Southern California uh, of the Chumash figure who has all the animals in harmony in dual in twos in a hut. Yeah, there's an Aboriginal tale of to that effect that uh, uh, God assembled uh, all the animals together and he took from them different characteristics and he rolled all those in a ball or he, she, whatever it was, rolled all those in a ball and that became the first human being. So mm. we we're composed of uh, you know, the cleverness of uh, some of the fox and we've got uh, the uh, hand manipulation of the monkeys and you know, we, we have a little of, of something from everybody and, and that's what a human being is. Just like Pandora, who has all the gifts of yeah. all the gods. Yeah. Fascinating. And, and I just want to confirm, I believe that we are, we're all clear. We're all good, guys. Jump back in. So Thank you, Corinne. Yeah, Please no, join us. Great job pinch hitting. Oh, my gosh. Um, but I would, this is such a great... You had to be here tonight to see that. Uh, this is a great segue um, because um, Joseph Campbell uh, taught at Esalen, which is a, another fascinating lineage, lineage and a great way to bring in Jeff. I have a two-part question for you, Jeff, because some people might not know what Esalen is or have a direct experience of Esalen. But if you could talk about that and maybe through the story of Joseph Campbell teaching there and some of the lineage of the hero's journey. And then, Chris, I'm going to ask you to pick it up from there to tell about how that might relate to Hollywood. So we'll have a stream of thought here. So Esalen, Esalen is an institute in Big Sur, California. It was founded in 1962 by two Stanford graduates, Michael Murphy and Richard Price. And it became one of the hubs really of the counterculture in the 1960s and 70s. The counterculture really doesn't get going till about 1964. So Esalen predates the counterculture, but then it kind of explodes up in Haight-Ashbury and San Francisco and Monterey, and then Big Sur with Esalen. And Esalen becomes the home of what we call the human potential movement, which is basically this idea that human beings have capacities or abilities that we're not aware of. And with the proper techniques, the proper practices, the, in this case, the proper storytelling, we can actualize those, those powers, essentially, those superpowers. Um, Campbell, you know, Campbell was a professor. He taught at Sarah, Sarah Lawrence. He was a comparative mythologist. And in 1966, Michael Murphy, whom you know well, Corinne, invited Campbell to Esalen. So that's the first time he's there in 66. He then basically celebrates all of his birthdays at Esalen. Esalen becomes kind of his spiritual home, really. Um, and in, in 1982, Phil Cusado interview, interviews him, and that's what becomes the book called The Hero's Journey. Um, Campbell himself really doesn't enter American popular culture until after he's dead. He, he dies in 1987. Um, I think it's 1987. And a year later, the Bill Moyers interviews, uh, The Power of Myth, come out. And that's really what makes him famous. I know, I know Chris is working, do it, working with him in Hollywood before that, but in terms of the public culture, that's kind of the jo Joseph Campbell story, really. And, and Esalen really was, was kind of his spiritual home in some sense. Yeah, I'll ask you to pick up the baton with that, Chris, with relating to Hollywood. We've got the Esalen view, now we want the Hollywood view. <laughs> well, uh, I think it, it was something that people were uh, aware of uh, within the studio system, it wasn't difficult to get conversations going about it. Um, I actually wrote a term paper when I was in film school at the same time that uh, uh, Star Wars, the first Star Wars movie came out. That's when I first encountered Campbell and I sort of slapped those two things together in my mind. And I wrote a paper explaining the uh, inexplicable uh, success of Star Wars. People in Hollywood were stunned. Why are the kids lining up around the block, watching the movie, and then they get in line and go again? Uh, and that had never happened before. That movie burst through a $100 million ceiling uh, and uh, created this whole new uh, field of, of blockbusters and special effects movies. And people were stunned. And so I wrote this paper trying to explain it's because it has this uh, Joseph Campbell skeletal structure in it, which was something that had been dormant for a long time and now was coming back to life through that film and others. 
Uh, so I really wanted to get the conversation going. So I took that term paper uh, and spread it around the studio and then later boiled it down to a seven page memo, which I sent around the studio. And uh, I had an intentionality about that. Mm -hmm. I had a very clear vision that if I went positively with this, uh, it would uh, go out, this memo would go and do work for me that I didn't have to do. It would spread. And that's exactly what happened. It became viral before uh, we had computers and uh, went viral through the brain of Hollywood. And so uh, I enjoyed very much uh, having the feedback from that and, and having people say, oh, yeah, I read Campbell in college, but I never thought about applying him to movies. And then there was a job to do to get them off of, well, it's just for adventure, right? It's just mm. for fantasy, right? And I said, no, this works for every genre I've ever dealt with, for comedy, drama, uh, uh, anything you can think of. Uh, this is uh, an effective tool to uh, uh, lay things out in the beginning, like Darren was talking about, for outlining things. But then later, as he said, troubleshooting, when you get deeper into it, then you go back and check again. And people were finding that was uh, a, a useful tool. And I talked to many filmmakers. I have never spoken to Lucas, but uh, talked to lots of directors who say, oh, yeah, I, absolutely. I met um, uh, George Miller, the Mad Max director, mm. uh, as I was on my way to a workshop that Campbell was doing out um, uh, on, on the coast somewhere. And Campbell was ill and he couldn't uh, present the thing. So they put up on the door this notice and I'm standing there and this man came up and I said, oh, you were here to see Mr. Campbell, right? And it turned out it was George Miller, the Mad Max director. So we had a wonderful conversation mm -hmm. about how he used it. And he said something I'll never mm -hmm. forget. He said, um, I didn't know anything about it on the first Mad Max movie. People told me about it then and I became conscious and I looked at it and I mm -hmm. used it on the second mm -hmm. movie. And then I forgot about it. It became internal on the third movie. But he said, I don't use it to tell Mel Gibson how to drive the truck. Hmm. You know, it's it's not prescriptive. It's not that uh, precise. And it's something that you use as guideline. Uh, and that's how I, I hope people use it in Hollywood. That's great. And for those in our community that are interested in this particular thread, because it could be a whole evening just around Star Wars and Campbell, there is an exhibit, um, Star Wars and Campbell exhibit, that has a guidebook. I do, I'm not thinking of the name of it. I'll find it and put it in the chat. That is the most brilliant deep dive into how uh, Star Wars and George Lucas used uh, Campbell's work. So anyone interested in that topic? I'm in a loop yeah. in a little bit. Can I have one more thing, Corinne, sure. if I may? Uh, well, first of all, one of the follow-ups to this is going to be an invitation to check out our last event on myth and Star Wars uh, and, and young and Star Wars. So, so please check that out. But also, you know, I just want to kind of um, uh, draw a little bit more circle around some of this conversation between what both Jeff and Chris have said, you know, so... What we saw was Jung. We heard Darren talk about Jung. Jung being one of his influences as well, right? So where did Campbell meet Jung? They used to go to a place called Aranos. And Aranos is one of the places that's kind of uh, of origin place for religious studies. Uh, and deaf psychology and mythology. And then Campbell comes to Esalen. And so in this way, he carries this extensive lineage that is mythological, psychological, religious studies, et cetera, brings it to California. And so you hear Chris say, by the time he's moving this through the studio system, it's already affected the consciousness of this world. And one of the things I want to uh, suggest is that Hollywood came out of California consciousness itself. And that the hero's journey is one of the biggest examples of that. Yeah, that's, that's well, fantastic. Brilliant. Wonderfully said. And that teased me up Everyone, for my next train of thought, which I want to um, loop in Jeff's, quite frankly, brilliant work uh, in the area of the paranormal. And um, so, Jeff, you've noted that the paranormal is about language and storytelling and that you want storytellers to own their own paranormal experiences in the creative process. I would love you to expand on that 
And once again, I think it might be mindful if you frame what your definition of paranormal is, because everybody has their own definition of paranormal, as we know. So that's kind of a two-parter. So, okay. And I apologize if I sound like a professor, because I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's important to know what I mean by the paranormal. It's, it's actually originally a French word, the paranormal. It's coined in 1903 by a French scientist, and it means it means to refer to something happening in the physical environment that corresponds perfectly to a state of mind. So, you know, for example, poltergeist phenomena tend to happen around conflicted teenagers, essentially, or traumatized people. So there's something happening psychically, and there's something happening in the environment, and they're corresponding in a kind of perfect fashion. That's what I mean by, by the paranormal. Right. Um, the idea you were referring to, so I, I spent about 10 years or so at Ashland actually listening to people tell me their paranormal experiences. And I've worked with experiencers, including a Jewish woman named Elizabeth Crone, who was struck by lightning in 1988 and had one of these classic near-death experiences, and came back massively precognitive, essentially had, had superpowers. Uh, and I've also worked extensively with, with Whitley Strieber, uh, the science fiction writer and an abductee. And when I listened to dozens and then hundreds of these experiences, what I realized was that at the end of the day, what they were were stories. And by that, I don't mean fictional. I mean, they, they happened, but they're appearing to these people through their imaginations, through their cultural imagination, and they're taking on a narrative form. And I had this sense that they wanted to become stories, that there's a kind of intentionality or agency to these experiences. They want to tell themselves through the human being. And if you talk to writers and they talk about getting in the zone, they talk in the exact same way. There's something coming through them. And what creativity is, is essentially getting out of the way and allowing the story or the piece of literature to come through you. And then I started to look at all these experiences and I noticed how they, were, they, they, they tended to organize themselves around actual books or texts or words or automatic writing, you know, or channeled speech. There was always language or communication involved. Um, and so that's, that's essentially what I was trying to say was that there's something about the creative process itself that corresponds to these uncanny experiences of the paranormal. Um, and so I look, I've looked at these a lot. The book you held up earlier is really about graphic novelists and comic book artists and their own paranormal experiences and how those events in their lives affected a change and made them essentially super creative. Yep, that's fantastic. That's great. And this um, parallels nicely because, um, Chris, what role um, do paranormal experiences have in your creative process in writing the uh, writer's journey? I think you have a good story for us, maybe. <laughs> yes, um, without a doubt. Uh, the whole thing is dependent on such an experience. Uh, the setup was I was in film school and um, I sort of created the conditions for uh, a transcendent experience, uh, the Maslowian uh, peak experience, they call it, uh, because I was writing this term paper about Campbell and Star Wars and how these things were interrelated. So I stayed up uh, doing all-nighters, as students do, uh, and exhausted myself. And that's one of the conditions that invites in this kind of uh, communication from wherever, the other world, let's say, the spirit world. Uh, but after I turned in the paper, I sat down with a, a mug of tea and uh, was surrounded by all the books and all the images that I had collected for this paper. And I had uh, first a vision. I saw uh, the idea of the collective unconscious, which is described somewhere in Jung's writing as a gigantic being as big as the uh, Milky Way galaxy. And I saw that thing and felt that, oh, I guess I'm part of that. And then began uh, what I described as a burst transmission, where for about 15 minutes, I just sat there 
as things bombarded me and I had the feeling I was surrounded by spirits, by benevolent nurses or doctors who uh, gathered around and said, oh, you're interested in this stuff, are you? Well, it's real. This thing exists, the hero's journey. And um, you have the opportunity to do something with this. And they gave me a choice. They said, you can um, do whatever you want with this. Uh, you could take it in a very uh, militaristic, dark direction. You could start a religion. You could, uh, you know, uh, conquer the world. You know, there's all these opportunities of power. Uh, on the other hand, you could use it for uh, benevolent purposes and helping people and so forth. And they said, it's up to you. And I didn't think very long and thought, well, if we can make the world better, let's do that. And they said, good choice. <laughs> and then, you know, continued uh, crystallizing my brain is the way I put it. Uh, it was like before that event, my brain was some simple geometric form like a cube. And when they were done with me, it had recrystallized into something else that had, you know, thousands of facets and all connected. Um, and at the end, they said, uh, if you go forward and put a plus sign on this and are positive about it, we will take care of you. We will be sure, you know, it's not that you won't have to work hard. You will have to work very hard, but we'll make sure that you're okay. And they have fulfilled that promise very nicely. So uh, that was my uh, initial experience of this. And there have been others, but that really set me up. It gave me a vision of where the thing had come from. Uh, looking back at my, uh, my own history, my parents, my grandparents, and so forth, all the way back to the beginning of life, and then looking ahead to uh, where this was going and how important it was and how necessary. So that's my uh, little uh, hero's journey uh, epiphany moment uh, where I, I felt that I was in the hands of something much bigger than me and uh, more powerful, but uh, something that gave me direction for the rest of my life. Oh, that's fantastic. It's terrific. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and Jeff, I want to loop in another theme of your work because you have done so much, um, so much work around superheroes. And this is more of kind of a what if question. How do we, for both of you, um, how do we not make superheroes, you know, tripes or boring or the same old, same, you know, how do, how do we make them interesting? I mean, that's a daunting uh, task, but they keep reinventing themselves, Jeff, as you know. <laughs> um, but how do we keep it fresh, interesting, and in integrating the work of the hero's journey, I guess is what I'm asking. So they, first of all, superheroes have not always been money makers. Uh, when I was a kid, you know, you bought these in drugstores and they were essentially soft porn for, for <laughs> adolescent boys. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it really didn't become Hollywood stuff until CGI and, and we've you know, Marvel moved out of comics and moved into film, and now we have all these movies. I, you know, that's not how I would prefer to think about superheroes. I, I think about superheroes more in the context of the history of religions and in the context of people, people's actual superpowers or super abilities that I think we all have. Um, I think of my friend Elizabeth again, Elizabeth Crone. She was um, just an ordinary... Jewish housewife and mother, and that's how she would describe herself. I'm not describing her for herself. That's how she would describe herself. And she um, was hit by lightning and went to heaven and came back and went to the underworld, if you want to use the hero's journey, and came back and began to essentially dream about what was about to happen the next day and what would appear in the news. And she could also read people. She could see auras now. Um, she, she took on all of these abilities. And... And what fascinates me about someone like Elizabeth is how, how they manage that, um, how they negotiate between their ordinary lives, as it were, and their superpowers or their, their, their paranormal capacities. And that it's never an easy negotiation. It's, it's never easy. And so what I've really, what I've really begged screenwriters and directors to do with, with no success, by the way, um, is, um, is make a movie about superpowers that's, that's true, it's real, it's historical, it's actual. I, I think as a culture, 
we love superheroes and we love these myths because it allows us to entertain parts of ourselves that our culture doesn't allow us to take seriously. But it does allow us to go watch a movie or tell a story. But actually a lot of these abilities are real and they appear all the time in people's lives. And those people tend not to talk about them. They're ashamed. They, they know they'll be made fun of. And so I think actually storytellers and filmmakers could do a great service to the culture by making films that affirm these things in a, not just in a fictional way, but also in a non-fictional way. That's great, brilliant. And I actually suggest even as you do that is, is like, I'm just, just a question, I don't think we're gonna give an answer right now, but a question to all the writers out there, like, have you ever had something paranormal happen in relation to something that you've written? I actually, I would wager a bet that most writers have had something like a paranormal experience actually connected to, you know, their writing. I know this is something you write about extensively. So, you know, hopefully writers can transmute that personal experience and validation of the importance of the paranormal in their own lives into uh, what you're calling for, you know, a serious um, use of the concept in uh, films. Let me say something about that and then let me add a, a complexity to it. So I think books are magical objects. And I think reading is a paranormal practice. And I think writing a book is essentially telepathy. Um, if you think about a book, if you pick up a book, if you pick up the writer's journey, you can recreate Chris's mind and heart and emotions and even his, his mystical experience that he just described in perfect detail in your own mind, in your own body. And Chris does not have to be in the same room with you. You know, I hope he's not actually. Um, <laughs> he, he doesn't even have to be, he doesn't even have to be present. He doesn't even have to be asleep, he can be asleep. So there's something really amazing about reading and writing that we don't quite understand. Okay. Here's the complexity now I want to add to this. And this is where I think screenwriting and, and fiction really come in. I think we're afraid of our own abilities. And I think for them to appear, they usually have to appear in fictional or imaginal form. I call this the trick of the truth. We have to be tricked into our own capacities. And we can't seem to own them ourselves. So instead of healing ourselves of, of some disease, we have to go to, a, we have to take a pilgrimage. We have to play, pray to a deity or pray to the Virgin Mary or something. But it's actually, I think, us healing us. Um, but for whatever reason, we can't own that. And so we need the fiction. We need the story to access those abilities. And I think that's what great storytelling is. It's certainly what myth is historically, is a kind of story that can access these, these kind of capacities. That is beautiful. So well said. It's its, its own conference <laughs> at Esalen. Um, I have uh, a couple of more questions. I mean, this evening is going much faster than I would like. Um, it, one of the questions that I thought was really interesting is, do you see uh, the narrative of the hero's journey in the direction of science, technology, uh, and progress? And do you see science and technology as presenting us with new metaphors? I think, you know, th these are interesting questions because we're so preoccupied with COVID right now, but we're also on the cusp of a very exciting time in, in science and technology right now. So I'd love to hear your take on that, Chris, and then loop back to you, Jeff. Well, um, I certainly agree with this idea. It's fantastic to hear this from somebody else that uh, books are magical objects, that writing is a magical process, that you can know the thoughts of a guy named Aristotle, uh, who has been dead for 2,400 years, uh, and you can get into his head, and, and that's quite uh, amazing uh, all on its own. Um, yeah, on the technology front, I have observed that movies have this odd ability to predict what's just around the corner in a funny way. Uh, I first became aware of this looking back at the movies just before my time from World War II and just before World War II. They knew it was coming, and it is spoken in the texts of many of the films, not just politically that it was coming, but they sensed the horrors of it and uh, all that. And it's it's easy to detect it in the films from about 1937 to 39. Uh, they, uh, they're uh, really shining a light in 
that direction. And then uh, before 9-11, uh, there was a, a, a uncanny concentration of films that had to do with big things hitting the earth, asteroids mm -hmm. coming down, buildings exploding, falling down, and so forth. And when that actually became a real event, um, it was a, a big problem for the studios for a while because they had so many things in production mm -hmm. that reflected that. And you couldn't put a building falling down uh, on the screen anymore. So they just had to set aside uh, uh, half the uh, production uh, slate at that time uh, because they had, had really almost uh, anticipated it. And I, I think something's going on. I've wondered for a long time, uh, what's with all the zombies? I don't particularly participate in the fascination with that, but somebody does. And um, I think it has something to do with what we're going through now, where you're not sure you can trust other people and being around other people. And are they going to give this thing to me? And, you know, uh, it, not unlike being bitten by a vampire or a werewolf or something. Uh, so I, I think um, that we use movies uh, as uh, crystal balls and mm -hmm. as ways of giving ourselves some orientation and uh, that that's, that's in operation right now. There we go. Yeah, that's great. Brilliant. Very well said. Um, so I have a couple more questions. I have one, Jeff, I'm, I'm going to loop back to you for one question because you didn't answer it in the first half and I'm interested. And then I'm going to do a wrap question. So I wanted to ask you a question, your take, I thought you had some interesting ideas around the movie Arrival of the feminine heroic. I mean, obviously as a woman, this is something that's interesting to me. It does come up quite often. I've studied uh, the writer's journey quite a bit. I, I studied it at school and that is probably the most asked question. So I thought you had some interesting takes on that. I'd love to hear your thoughts and then I'm gonna give a wrap question to the panel. Yeah, let me say two things. First of all, I do really don't want to speak for the women, um, but you're <laughs> asking me the question, so I suppose I have to. Um, I, I have worked with many women who are so gifted, and they do have hero's journeys uh, that map onto what Chris has done very well. Uh, for example, these near-death experiences work very, very well with the model. So I do think it works with, with all sorts of people. I also think that the hero's journey is a male myth um, and that we're moving out of it, and that we're moving into something else. And the movie I always love to talk about is Arrival. Um, I tend not, I, I'm, I'm addicted, I'm obsessed with UFOs, but I hate UFO movies because mm -hmm. most, most UFO movies are essentially Cold War narrative. There's some, there's some enemy outside that's invading the great Christian American nation and we got to fight it off and blah, 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 blah. There's always things blowing up and we're shooting things in the sky and it's very military minded. It's very male. It's very Cold War. Arrival totally broke with that narrative. If you've seen the movie, you know that the military is, plays a big role in the movie, but only by holding back. They actually don't do anything. And the main character the, is the Amy Adams character is a woman named Louise Banks, who figures out that the reason the aliens are there are to communicate with us, not to fight or invade us. And she figures this out by essentially exposing herself opening herself up, taking her suit off, and learning their language, which happens to look a lot like Zen. <laughs> so they speak in circles, you know, these beautiful ink circles. And the Amy Adams character is not a scientist. She's a linguist. She's not a man. She's a woman. And what she learns is that there is no time or time is a circle. And so the whole movie functions around this cir circularity of her precognition of her daughter's death. And so there's this deep, deep love connection between a mother and a daughter. There's this female heroine. It's all about contact. It's all about communication. The people who fight in the movie are, the, are frankly the idiots, you know? <laughs> Um, and so this is a, this is a complete rake 
with this Cold War mythology, moving us into a different kind of mythological realm that I just, I just thought was fantastic. That's great. I, I love, love, love that example. And I'll use that as a segue for another pitch for Chris's book before I lo love him. The last question, which is one of my favorite uh, films lately has been Shape of Water. Um, and I would argue we have a whole nother seminar about that from the feminine perspective. I think there's a very strong feminine perspective, strong feminine roles that won an Academy Award, very mythic. Um, and I don't want to give it away because, um, but Chris does an absolutely brilliant case study on this film. I've, I've read it probably five or six times. It is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And I think that is, leads me into um, my next and final question because Chris has updated this book and there's nothing more disappointing to me than when I fall in love with the book, like I did Chris, and then there's an update and it means that the uh, author wrote two new pages. Chris has gone way, way beyond. There's a new intro, there's new updates throughout. There's a huge new case study on Shape of Water. Um, it, it's stunning and beautiful and makes it topical. So um, this is really a 25th edition. It isn't just a glossy, beautiful new cover. So that swings me into my final and maybe my favorite question. And hopefully you could do a wrap, Chris. It's been a lovely evening, lovely evening for a lovely man. And our storytelling tellers, the new shamans of our future. I'm giving you a softball lob to go out on. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, that's uh, <laughs> one of my themes. Uh, the, uh, the idea I realized very early on when I first encountered uh, the notion of uh, shamans uh, and had some experiences, uh, I think, you know, my vision that I described was a shamanic vision. And um, I felt some uh, kinship with that universe. Um, so I uh, think that that's what we are as uh, filmmakers, as directors, as writers. Uh, we don't have the formal shamans in our society. Uh, I mean, there are professional shamans uh, and in, in uh, so-called uh, primitive societies or uh, uh, un unsophisticated societies that uh, aren't participating in our fancy world, uh, they still exist, but uh, uh, we need them. And we need them to uh, process things and to go inside where Jeff is talking about these experiences uh, emanating from. Um, you know, our, it's an, an open question. Is it some spirit world outside us or is it inside? I think it's basically uh, inside. Um, and that's where the shamanic experience happens. And the essence of that is um, going to another world and seeking a vision and then bringing that vision back in some form that can be shared with everybody else. And that's where it comes out as a story, as a song, as a dance. Uh, and all of those forms are uh, looking at the current problem of the society and giving some kind of prescriptive uh, answer uh, through the, the, the uh, palatable form of a, a story. It's, it's not coming down like uh, some uh, written prescription, but as uh, an entertaining uh, way of getting at it metaphorically, getting at truth and reality in a, a metaphoric way, in a story way, uh, so that we can uh, digest it on that more poetic level, uh, not just involving the brain, but also all the organs of the body. And that's some place where I, I do uh, correspond with Campbell. I, I feel that was one of his gifts, was the idea that these things are happening in the body. It's hardwired into the human nervous system to experience these things and to uh, feel uh, these uh, things deeply when we see moving stories uh, and we are looking for meaning all the time in those. So uh, absolutely, I think that's a, a high calling for us filmmakers and storytellers. And uh, that's, uh, that's our tribe. Mm. Beautiful. Excellence is what we really want to live by. And tonight we got to hear the origins of the writer's journey all the way from the first introduction of the book and where you found the book through to your uh, transformational mystical experiences 
Uh, and finally, into how you influence the studio system and how one of our world's leading mythological directors is using your work now and recommending it to everybody uh, that he works with. And we also got a chance to expand the conversation for you to call for future work, to point to other things that need to happen in this space. And it's just been an absolutely excellent conversation, a historic evening. And I want to thank everybody that's, that's been a part of it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Corinne. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Darren, and thank you, Dana. Uh, and I think with that, we'll end us out, we'll close us out with the video, uh, this tribute to Christopher Vogler. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thanks a lot, everyone. Trust the path. Hi, Chris. Neha Dutta here. On behalf of the entire Screencraft community, congratulations on the 25th anniversary of your essential and influential book, The Writer's Journey. The first time I met Chris Vogler, I was a junior executive in Disney Animation, and he brought me a, uh, a photocopied uh, first draft. I think it was basically the introduction to Hero with a Thousand pace Faces, and it immediately became one of the uh, seminal works that we relied on in developing Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, uh, and The Lion King. So... You know, Chris is one of the unsung heroes of Disney animation development uh, in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. And uh, along the way, we became great friends. And I am deeply grateful to have been able to work with Chris. And um, I have recommended his wonderful book to many, many people. Congratulations, Chris. Keep it in print. Keep the good word going. And keep telling them kids how to tell great stories. Hey, Chris. Congratulations on the 25th anniversary of the publications of The Writer's Journey. I'm so grateful for that book, which has informed my life more than any other book ever, except maybe the Bible. As a writing coach, I take it into all the prisons and jails where I teach, and it informs their lives in a big way, they tell me. It's been an honor to know you over the years. I'm so proud of you, so proud of this moment. And whenever we interact, you've been such a mentor to me. I feel like I'm channeling Joseph Campbell himself. Thank you, Chris. I'm so grateful. And here's to 25 more years of the writer's journey informing people's lives. Hey Chris, John Booker here. I want to thank you for the way that you have led our storytelling tribe for the past 25 years. I am anxious to replace this copy of your book, which always sits nearby on my shelf, with the new 25th anniversary edition. You have been a gift to writers all over the world. You have influenced me and in my work, both in what I've created for the screen, as well as my own storytelling books, and I'm so thankful for you. Hi Chris, it's Dorothy Rumpelski, director of the David Lynch MFA program in screenwriting at Maharishi International University. I don't think there's a book I've seen on more film and screenwriting course reading lists than The Writer's Journey. And it's obvious why. Your insight into how stories work is just unparalleled. And I'm really looking forward to learning all kinds of new things from the new material in this beautiful 25th anniversary edition. Congratulations. Hi, Chris. Your masterpiece has improved the understanding of our world. Like AI, blockchain and CRISPR, the hero's journey is one of the great discoveries of humankind. The 12 stages inspire me and millions of people around the globe to live their best life. It is a road of light for everyone. I can only thank you infinitely. As a screenwriter and teacher of emerging storytellers, I draw on so many things I've learned from Christopher Vogler. So to one who has helped me understand why stories touch me so deeply, thank you and congratulations on 25 years of the writer's journey. Hi there, my name is Brendan Davis and I wanna just take a moment to wish a huge congratulations to my friend Chris Vogler on his 25th anniversary edition of The Writer's Journey. Like so many people, the book had a really serious impact on me when I first read it. And again, congratulations on the journey. Congratulations, Chris Vogler, on 25 years. Uh, that is 25 years of providing a path for those of us terrible at following paths. You let us go out here and then find our way back and find our way through the story. Thank you. If you want to tell an indelible story with a great hero, it's going to have 
two things in common. One is the DNA of Joseph Campbell's hero, hero with a Thousand Faces. And two, the DNA of Christopher Vogler, whose teachings and writings have influenced movies and filmmakers, writers, directors, and artists all around the world. So I just wanna say thank you and congratulations. Hey, if this is a Chris Vogler night, We've got the Vikings. I'm so happy to be part of your celebration, Chris, your 25 years of your wonderful book. We've written scripts together. We've done workshops together. Uh, we've traveled together. We've yacked together. Uh, and since there's always the bar, we've had Primitivo together. My um, McKee book is up there on that bookshelf somewhere. And uh, it's gathering dust. I've opened it once, but here, is my signed autographed copy you gave me of The Writer's Journey. And you can see I have no use for this book whatsoever. I never open it. What you've done for writers is you've canonized and the mythology of storytelling burned into the ether of the universe. 25 years, there'll be another 25 years, another 50 years. But what you've done for writers is eternal and will go on forever. So, um... I'm raising a glass to you tonight, Maestro. Hail Ragnar. And hail Ragnar's beard. Long may you run, good sir. Hey, Chris Vogler, it's David Kirshner. It's been a long time. I just wanted to say congratulations on the 25th anniversary of your staggering book that has helped so many of us. I had the great pleasure of working with you at Disney in the very early part of my career and now 40 some odd projects later, you are just a part of, of who I am and what you've, what you've created with that milestone of a book. Congratulations, we're so proud of you. <laughs> In feed. <laughs> good night. Okay, okay, good rehearsal. Now let's shoot it. <laughs>